Welcome to Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 10 at County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage. Or you can visit us at gbcportage.com for more information about the church and get links for our live streams. And here's Pastor Jeremy Edmondson. I actually wish we would stop using the word salvation and we would start talking about justification because of how pivotal and important it is for the believer in Christ to understand that. And it's not that salvation is a bad word, but we've turned it into a generic coverall that's really lost all of its meaning. And when we talk about justification, we are talking about a punch that cannot be denied. And this is what puts us into these beautiful verses of Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now, and I love it because it's a point in time, apart from the law. Now remember, is the law good? Yes. Is it righteous? Yes. Is it holy? Yes. The failure is in our ability to keep it. And since we cannot keep it, we cannot incur a righteousness of our own. So because we cannot incur a righteousness of our own, God has made righteousness possible apart from the law in any way. The law has no part in justification, no part. The law condemns and tells us that we are sinners beyond compare or reason and that we have no excuse before a holy God. But righteousness, the very righteousness of God, and I think that's important for us to understand. This isn't a second-class righteousness. This isn't the righteousness that was only available at the Dollar Tree, and you couldn't get it at a much higher department store or something like that. This is the very righteousness of God. It is righteous on His level because it is Christ's righteousness. It is now manifested apart from the law. It's been revealed. It's been publicly exposed. It's been made known. It's been shown in some way. And notice that it says after that, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The idea of a witness is where we get the English word martyr from. It is someone who's willing to testify of a situation, to confirm that something is true, uh, to bring an affirmation or a validation about a statement, and, and affirming that it is correct, actually being pro that concept. Well, that's what this is. This manifestation of God's righteousness finds that the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, has constantly pointed and championed towards this purpose. And I want you to mark it well, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, notice that Paul had to bring it up twice in this sentence, so we know exactly what we're dealing with, through, there's the channel, there's the means of appropriation, faith in Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this for just a second. Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. Now, I don't say object to demean his purpose at all. I'm saying that he is what we are placing our faith in. Faith, the Greek word pistis, simply means conviction. You are convinced that it is true. Some people have used the word persuaded, uh, but with our, our our modern understanding of that, we may not fully grasp what that means, but to be convinced of something, to understand that the chair that you are sitting in would definitely hold you, you were convinced when you sat down in it. You didn't test it first, you didn't wiggle it around to make sure it was going to do it, you plopped down and you joined us for today. You were convinced. It's a conviction that someone has, and that conviction is not on a scale or a level of whether or not it's genuine conviction, quality conviction, heavy conviction, light conviction. It has nothing to do with that. It is not dealing with different degrees of faith. You either believe or you do not believe. What is important about faith is the object in which you are believing. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because God's righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. Therefore, he is righteousness. That's important to understand. It's not just that Jesus is righteous. We would gauge all that by reading through the Gospels and say, yes, he was a righteous man, and we would equate that with deeds. No, he is righteousness because that's who he is in his person. If he never performed one deed on earth whatsoever, he would still be righteous in his person. His deeds were just a manifestation of the righteousness that was already intrinsic of him. Now, notice, 
It's through this righteousness has been manifested, revealed through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Notice that is the condition in place. Faith is simply by the channel, or is simply the channel of which God's righteousness is appropriated to us. And what we call that is imputed righteousness. Now, don't get all messed up on these $5 words, but it's important for Christians to understand them. Again, you cannot grow in your faith, and you will not be victorious over sin if you do not understand the idea of justification by faith alone and the imputed righteousness of Christ. It is impossible. The word imputed means to be credited to your account. So if any of you have ever heard me teach before, you're familiar with this illustration, get up, go to the restroom for a second or whatever, and then come back when I'm done with it. But imagine that you have this bank account at the local bank, and this bank account is full of dirt, slime, cobwebs, bugs, roaches, everything that's nasty and gross about life, it's all in your account because we're sinners and that's what our account looks like before a holy God. Now, it just so happens that Jesus Christ banks at the same place that you do. And because Jesus banks there, the banker can look into his account and what they see in Jesus's account is overflowing and bursting and glorious and perfection. He is rich beyond compare. They can't even put a number on it, how rich and boiling over he is. At the moment of faith, you hear the gospel and you respond in belief. When you believe in the gospel, there is a connecting wire that is automatically plugged from Jesus's infinite bank account into our completely bankrupt bank account. And now whenever the banker looks into your bank account, he now sees everything that is in Jesus's bank account accredited to, credited to you. Now notice this is a righteousness that is imputed, credited to you. It is not imparted to you. The idea that righteousness has been imparted to you or that you are made righteous is a Catholic doctrine. And they see justification as a process, not an instantaneous event, not as a forensic declaration. It's important to recognize the difference. It's not that we are made righteous. We are not. We are not made righteous. We still have this sin nature within us. We don't necessarily get progressively better in ourselves because our flesh amounts to nothing. Remember what we saw in Philippians. Even Paul considered that the flesh would not suffice in his situation. And so now that we have this great imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ to our account, God sees us as he sees Christ. That is so important for us to understand. It is not that we've had some magnificent inner moral change that has taken place. It is God's act of announcing us as not guilty in the halls of of eternity. And why are we not guilty? Because we never did anything wrong? No, that's not the situation at all. Is it because uh, we've, we've been able to pull together something of our own so that God would look favorably on us? No, it has nothing to do with that at all. It has everything to do with the fact that he now sees us through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is vitally important for us to get. Let me give you some definitions that go on here of justification. This is Lewis Sperry Chafer. Divine justification is the decree or public acknowledgement on the part of God that the believer whom he sees perfected with respect to standing, notice that's the position, being in Christ is justified in his sight. It is obvious that none are actually justified until they believe, but provisionally the righteous ground upon which they could be justified when they do believe was secured once for all by Christ in his death. Jesus Christ has died for the sins of the world, and because he has forgiven those sins, the grounds of justification before God being declared righteous are now made available to all who believe the gospel. This is uh, what I have listed probably as quote number two, on proclaim, but if you want to see it up there, this is Miles Stanford. He says, the meaning of justification is to pronounce righteousness, 
not to make righteous. What is imputed is not, in fact, imparted. To be justified means that the believer is viewed in Christ as righteous and is treated as such by God. Now, everybody understand this, mark this, pay attention to this. So many people that, are, that have been believers for years run around asking the question, is God mad at me? Is God mad at me? Is God mad at me? Let me tell you emphatically, no, God is not mad at you because God is not mad at his son. And you and I as believers are in his son. He treats us, he treats you, he treats me as he treats his son. He does not treat us differently. We are so unified. We are such in union with Christ when we respond to the gospel that we are inseparable from Christ, spiritually speaking. And God does not see our sin because all he sees is Christ. We are not made righteous. We are able to be credited with the righteousness that belongs to Christ alone. And since we are in union with him, we are seen as having the perfect righteousness of God that is found only in the person of Jesus Christ. It says here, until we clearly see the positional perfection of our justification in Christ, our conception of and faith in all other aspects of our position will be out of focus. In other words, we have to understand justification by faith. If this is a new concept to you, I encourage you to get a copy of The Complete Green Letters by Miles J. Stanford because it speaks over and over about our position in Christ, and it points you to all of the scriptures that deal with our position in Christ. Until we are affirmed in our position, we will not grow in our relationship with Christ. Now, just so you know, we have 18 copies of that book available for distribution right now. And if you will email into office at gbcportage.com, we will try to get those in the mail and to your door so that you can begin reading through them. They are used copies. That was a good way to get them cheap. But they're awesome, awesome works that will, will take you quite a while to sort through and deal with the scripture passages. If you could see my copy right now in front of me, it's all marked up and highlighted everywhere, and I could stand to spend more copy, uh, more, more time looking at my copy to point me to the scripture so that my mind will be renewed with this idea. Going to the other quote by Stanford that I have here, it says, every Christian has been positioned forever in the risen Lord by spiritual birth. We've been born again. When you believe, you're born again. It says here, but only the believer who knows grows. That's important. It is faith in the facts of our position that give us the daily benefits of growth in our condition. If the believer is not clearly aware of the specific truths of the word, he cannot exercise the necessary faith for growth and service. He can only seek his resources in the realm of self, and that self would be the flesh. Folks, let me tell you, we have no resources in and of ourselves. Everything that we draw off of to live this life, to deal with our present situation that we're looking at, is already found in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we are neglecting that storehouse of wealth and grace in order to get us through this time, there's no wonder why we're depressed. There's no wonder why we're discouraged, why we feel like we're failing, why we feel like life amounts to nothing, is because we have a limit. We are finite. And it doesn't go beyond us. We can't conjure more good thoughts or good vibes in order to be better understanding of our place. Is exercise good for us? Yes, it is. You can exercise all you want. You'd still be a part of righteous thinking, uh, apart from, excuse me, righteous thinking, if you are not looking at the position that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we sit here and we think about the idea of the righteousness of God and it being a positional fact. His death is the grounds for justification. When Jesus died on the cross, some people might ask, you know, if you're not familiar much with what's going on with the Bible, you know that Jesus died, but you're not for sure why. Jesus died to provide a grounds to where not only we could be forgiven of sin, 
That's the negative taken away. Our sin is taken away from us. It's a subtraction that takes place. But the addition is a right standing before God, a full acceptance before God, that he sees us favorably because of his son. I've got a quote here from Earl Rodmacher. It says here, when a person is persuaded of the genuineness of the offer of salvation and believes in Christ, at that moment he is clothed in the righteousness provided by Christ so that his righteousness becomes his very own, so that Jesus' righteousness becomes our very own. God legally pronounces him justified. God subtracts the penalty of sin and adds the standing of righteousness. The believer then has an official standing as a member of the royal family, clothed in the robe of Christ's righteousness. Do you realize that you're clothed this morning? If you've believed in Christ, his very righteousness encompasses your standing before God. It is holy, it is pure, it is fully accepted in Christ. And what's amazing is there's only one condition, believe. Notice it says there, for all those who believe, who are convinced that Jesus Christ has died for their sins, risen from the grave. That's how he supplied these things for us. Well, notice it says here at the end of verse 22, for there is no distinction. There is no difference. There is no discrimination in this situation as far as the world is concerned. And the provision, I think it's important, not just the fact that we're all sinners, not that we're all in the same boat of sin, but there is no difference or discrimination. There are no privileged segments regarding the means of righteousness. Christ's death is for all people if they would simply believe. Why is that? For all have sinned. All are sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, being a sinner, being guilty, is what qualifies you to be a recipient of justification. That's the qualification that puts you in position to receive that truth. What's interesting is there's nothing to be earned there. It's just everything that we are. So being born into Adam, being born in Adam, being born into sin, being a sinner by birth and also a sinner by choice, we find ourselves in a situation where we've fallen short of the glory of God. Now, there's been a lot of debate about what in the world does that mean? What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? Well, number one, all things in all history is going to culminate in his glory. But I think this points back to a specific point in time. And I think this deals with how human beings were originally created in Eden. If you go back and you read the narrative of Genesis in 1 and 2, and you find out that they walked with God, they were able to converse with Him, they were given responsibility by Him, they had a sinless marriage that took place. They were encouraged to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It was a time where none of that pain that we often experience in life is even evident. It's where we originally were before it was lost in Eden. I think some of this is seen, if you do research on the Hebrew words that are used in Genesis 2.25 for naked, and then again in Genesis 3, 7, after the fall happens of the word naked. They're both derived from the same root word in the Hebrew, but they're different. And I, I believe that they're different on purpose. Uh, if anything, because of the context around them. In 2.25, you see that Adam and Eve were naked, but they were not ashamed. But in 3.7, you see that they begin scraping to cover themselves because they've experienced shame because they can now see themselves. That's the difference. There was a glory, I believe, that surrounded them. Some people believe it was the Holy Spirit that was over them at that time. All of sin, and that's a horrible thing, but it's a positive thing in the fact that it's now qualified you to be declared righteous by God in the halls of eternity because of what Christ Jesus has done. If you're guilty of sin, Christ has died for you. If you're familiar with the Bible and church life, but I don't think it's something we can easily run past as having right standing in his presence. It's not the fact that we don't deserve punishment. Of course we deserve punishment. 
It's the fact that the punishment that we deserved, that the judge has pronounced upon all guilty people, was fulfilled by another. We can't afford to belittle the cross. We can't afford to let that become mundane or routine. Is a pronouncement that is based solely on the provision of Christ. That's it. But it's enough, and it's not just enough, it's exceedingly abounding and more. The judge has exhibited undeserved favor upon us who were on the death row of eternity. When we look at things like John 3, 16, 17, 18, you see that, of course, God loved the world. He gave his son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But it's interesting that those who are condemned are condemned already for one reason. They have not believed. Belief is the crux issue. Your time this week on the idea of our justification, do some extra research on justification. Please get involved and look at all that is encompassed in justification. Because with justification, we are now placed in this accepted position because of Jesus. It needs to fill our minds, and we constantly need to be looking at our position if our condition is to amount to anything. Now, what do I mean by that? Our position is the place where we're accepted before God, and that place has a name. It's called In Christ. When you believe in Jesus, you are now put in Christ as your permanent position. When we talk about condition or practice, we talk about how we operate in life, how we um, are expressing ourselves or what is coming out of us. We would talk about sins, plural. In fact, let me show you a very interesting little uh, point here in, in a passage that we're all familiar with. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 1. Let's look at 8 and 9. I want to show you the differences here. Even John uses it this way. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Notice what it says. If we say that we have no sin, notice that that's singular. That's the sin nature, the sin principle, uh, what Paul sometimes calls the old man. But notice, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves And the truth is not in us. We're not accepting the truth about ourselves. The fact that we have sin as a a principle, as a nature, original sin residing in us. But notice the verse we're all familiar with. If we confess our sins, those acts that that we commit, those offenses committed, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, again plural, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice that verse 9 deals with the idea of our position, and the forgiveness of our sins, and it's a restoring of our fellowship with him because it's all based upon our position, our position in Christ, making it possible for the sins that we still commit today to still be put under righteousness and forgiven, and that all that we can't even remember to be taken care of, sins we don't even know that we've committed, God is thorough enough to deal with them. The idea of eternal security and assurance in relation to the doctrine of justification and just how important this is. The idea of us being declared righteous by God, this is a public declaration. Everybody knows in the unseen realm. This is the reason why spiritual warfare becomes an increased and heightened problem and temptations seem to be heightened for the believer in Christ. They still have the capacity to sin. We still have the capacity to sin. The sin nature in us is aroused when we're told not to do something. That's the thing that we want to do. Somebody says, don't go in the basement. Where do you find yourself wanting to go for no reason? In the basement. It's that type of thing. But because we are aroused towards sin in this situation, many times we can get blurry about our security in Christ. And I want to talk about the idea of why all this is put together. I don't know, for some reason I'm having trouble expressing myself in this point. Everything about our life rests on our position in Christ, fully accepted before God and declared righteous in eternity. If we've had poor doctrinal teaching on justification, this will lead to to failure, where we're not looking to Christ, but instead we're looking at our conduct, our practice, our condition. And that is not the place where anything good is ever going on. In fact, I want to read to you this quote by Stanford I thought was interesting. 
in the green letters. He says here, Assurance of justification results when we realize what our Father has done and said. It's never based on feelings. Someone has said, because God has spoken, I am sure. Because I am sure, I feel at rest. He says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth from Colossians 3.2. And it is here that the first major mistake in our Christian life is often made. In taking the position of justification by faith in the Lord Jesus, the new standing of life began to make a marked difference in our state or in our condition is what he means by that. Because of this, we shifted the basis of our assurance from eternal position to temporal condition. In other words, when we started focusing on our accepted position in Christ, we noticed that our lives started to produce holy things. And we noticed that the change in our lives was taking place and righteousness was being expressed through us. And because we noticed that going on, our eyes drifted from our accepted position in Christ to how we're doing in this life, how we're acting, how we're saying things. And that's the first mistake we often make. Because of this, we shifted our basis from our assurance in our eternal position to temporal condition. And we looked and felt and sounded saved. Hence, we were assured of our salvation. But then, one morning came the dawn, and we didn't look very saved. We didn't feel at all saved. And so we didn't sound saved either. All day long, everything and everybody went wrong, and by nightfall, we found ourselves at the end of our assurance. Thoroughly shaken, we determined to rectify matters the next day. On that day, we strove to look saved, to feel saved, and to sound saved. We kept trying and trying and trying is the idea. But because we were centered in our condition, all was wretched failure. We even began to question our salvation. If the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? In the Lord's time, the Comforter refocused our faith on our position by means of the Word, and our assurance of salvation was again anchored on the rock, Jesus Christ. With this assurance reestablished, our condition began to improve as a result of the position in which we stood by faith. We had learned our first important lesson, the necessity of knowing and abiding in our position. Apart from this abiding, there is nothing but frustration and failure. Now let's sum that up in very basic Kentucky terms. It ain't about how you're doing. It's about Jesus Christ being. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And that is our position of acceptance before God. And all that we ever need to be is found in that position. Don't move your eyes from it. That's what it is to abide, to stick with your position in Christ. Now, when we start to drift and look at our condition, and we'll all do that, we'll all fail in that way, and then we'll get discouraged and we'll question our salvation. I did that for about four years, uh, and it was miserable. But you will start to doubt the very things that God has said is true about you, and he says that they're true because of Christ. And so I want you to think about the idea that justification is a public declaration. It is God declaring you as righteous. That righteousness has been credited to you. And if you could lose your salvation, would that not deny your union with Christ? You weren't as unified as you thought you were as the Bible tells you that you are. That's a problem. Because I don't know of anything that Jesus has been unified to that he was unified partially or haphazardly or he was just kind of halfway in. No, Jesus does a perfect job in everything. It would also remove your identification as a believer from Christ's death and life. There's no assurance there. If you can't be identified with Christ and that righteousness be declared to you, you have no grounds to stand on. So to say that you could lose your salvation keeps someone in perpetual infancy. What else is interesting is such a declaration can only be made apart from the presence of sin. Thank God that Jesus Christ is sinless for us, because that's not us. And so the payment of the believer's sin by the blood cannot be returned. 
People are having trouble returning toilet paper. Imagine trying to return the payment of the blood of Jesus Christ for your sins. God's customer service is not accepting that receipt. It's not going to happen. When we think about the idea that when we become believers in Christ, we're indwelt with the Spirit. We're sealed with the Spirit. The Spirit's a deposit. Can we be unsealed from the Spirit? Can the Spirit be withdrawn from us? It certainly brings a lot of question about the phrase eternal life. Salvation is not, or excuse me, justification is not a probationary period. You've been locked up because of the declaration of God. If his declaration is a public declaration of righteousness as far as we're concerned, if it's universal in its scope, we're not just uh, declared righteous in America, we're declared righteous regardless of where we go, either here on earth or in eternity. That's based on God's word, what he says about us being true. Would God go back on his word? He would not. Would he make such a declaration if he knew that it was only going to have limited endurance? He would not. If it were possible to lose your salvation, would that not bring great embarrassment upon God for him stepping forward and declaring us righteous to the world? Hopefully you will see some of the ramifications of the idea of some people's doubt of eternal security and, and what that can bring. If you can lose your justification, what does that say about the unchangingness of God? Could you really trust the character of God in the fact that he is unchanging, that he never changes, that he's immutable? You couldn't trust that either. The issue of eternal security in relation to justification and righteousness, is that the focus, again, it gets placed on our performance, how well we're doing in life. We look around at our life's condition. That starts to consume our thoughts. We start to get obsessed with our present attitude towards things. Maybe a turn of events has happened in your life, and that got your eyes off of your accepted position in Christ. But where it needs to be is on God's Savior who was set forth at the right time. In fact, if you would look at your Romans paper real quick and you look at verse 20, look what it says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. If we were denying the eternal security in our justification, that means that we've forgotten or we're dismissing or we're neglecting what Romans 3.20 tells us. If performance was necessary to keep God's righteousness then we are seeking to stay justified by the law. This verse right here warns against that. No flesh will be justified. It's impossible. It's amazing to think that because of the perfect work of Jesus Christ and the person that he is, you and I are declared righteous. We're declared clean. Uh, it's interesting, when I, when I think about that word clean, I think about what the Bible says about lepers in the Old Testament, about who I truly am apart from Christ. And then Christ coming into my life and all that he is being imparted to me and, and all of how he is treated by the Father, I'm now treated likewise because of him. I'm a leper sitting in the best seat at the table. I'm being looked upon as if I were whole and that people were not running and screaming from me. It's not because my sin has been eradicated, but the fact that it's been covered by the Lamb of God. That's a beautiful thought. It's beautiful to think that God treats us like sons and daughters, fully accepted into his family, bringing nothing but the very sin we needed to be saved from and finding complete forgiveness and full acceptance because we've now been moved into a new location that is Christ Jesus our Lord. I hope your heart praises him this morning, that God does not hold sin against you that he sees you as he sees his son. Our thoughts that are out of control, our actions that seem to get away from us, our pet sins that we keep hidden, they are all under the banner of the blood of Christ. And you look upon us as free people. You look upon us as having been satisfied with the payment rendered by another. All that we deserved and all that we could never pay for has been washed away. Help us to ponder what it is to be declared righteous, that you have declared us righteous, and you declare us righteous because of Jesus our Lord. My mind so badly wants to try to wrap around what you've done for us, and I can't. But I know the proper response is for all of us to say thank you, to bring 
a heart of thankfulness and humility before you and to glorify Jesus because of our position in your sight. And I pray, God, that the Spirit would impress that upon our hearts and minds now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Walking in Grace, presented by Grace Bible Church in Portage. Join us Sunday mornings at 10 at County Highway CX next to Edgewater Greenhouse in Portage, Wisconsin. Or you can visit us at gbcportage.com for more information about the church and to get links for our live streams. Thank you for listening to Walking in Grace.